All right, so welcome back from lunch, everyone. And um, it's my great pleasure to be able to introduce to you Professor Steve Lansing, who is um, an external professor at Santa Fe Institute, a professor of anthropology at University of Arizona with a joint appointment in ecology and evolutionary biology, and the senior research fellow at the Stockholm Resilience Center. Now, just as you would guess from someone with such a range of appointments in various faculties and various institutes, uh, Professor Lan Lansing does truly interdisciplinary work and has a long-standing interest in Indonesia and it has done research on, in Bali in particular where we see some of his distinctive way of combining various areas, so combining things from complexity theory and anthropology and even uh, conservation work, I believe, when it comes to the water irrigation systems. Um, and Professor Lansing has also <coughs> published widely in these areas, so some recent books uh, is uh, a book called Perfect Order, Recognizing Complexity in Bali, and Priests and Programmers, Technologies <laughs> of Power in the engineered landscape of Bali. Now, today I'm guessing that we will see work drawing on both anthropology and complexity studies as well, but today we're gonna to get a talk on the Astronesian expansion, and intriguingly, as it says in the title, whether clouds of butterflies propelled the last great human migration. Now, since I cannot tell you the answer as to whether or not that is the case. So join me in welcoming Professor Lansing to tell us. Thank you very much. Um, the good thing about these complexity meetings is that you hear a lot of interesting talks because everybody needs to you know, hit, hit, tell their best story, basically, so that it can uh, resonate with a, an interdisciplinary audience. The, the bad news is if you have to give a talk, and follow all the great ones, and it's a little scary, but, uh, but I'll do my best. So I'm an anthropologist, and I want to introduce my dear friend uh, and colleague, Safarina Malik, who's here, because I'm going to be talking. Do you mind standing up, Ina? Um, <laughs> thank you. So we <laughs> I'm going to be talking about the work that we've been doing for the last decade in Indonesia, which has to do with genetics. But um, as you probably know, most of genetics is now big science, right? People do things, basically doing association studies, trying to figure out the relationship between diseases and whole genomes. So the thousand genome project, the HapMap and so forth, thousand plant genomes, there are lots of projects like that. That's not what we've been up to. I'm an anthropologist. And for the last 10 years, more or less, Ina and I and her colleagues at the Ekman Institute for Molecular Biology in Jakarta have been going out and visiting villages in the islands of Indonesia. So uh, why do we do that? Well, our, the thought goes like this. The association studies are great and they're important and the sequencing must go on and things will undoubtedly be learned from those studies. But uh, genetic changes actually happen in communities through a process we call sex. And um, in the same places, we also have other kinds of changes going on with respect to things like languages and the movement of diseases. So we thought it might be interesting to go and focus on particular communities and try and figure out how those processes interact at the scale where they actually occur, right? Because that's where, that's where this sex thing, all that sort of stuff actually happens in villages. So by now it's, what is it? It's like 71 villages, 13 islands later, we have a lot of data. And I'm going to tell you a story about some of it. So we'll, we won't be able to get into the medical stories now. But I'll tell you a couple of stories. This will be about the relationship between local interactions. I'm not going to say sex again, but you get the point, right? Things happening in villages, right? <laughs> and then the global scale effects of those processes. And this is going to be about two versions. It's not really the butterfly effect. It's just inspired by the butterfly effect. The question is, is it the case that sometimes what might strike us as very small changes, little tiny flutterings of a butterfly's wings with respect to words and genes, things like that, might lead to big changes? And so I'm going to give you two examples. In one case, it's how little tiny changes may have 
change the whole history of the Indo-Pacific. And the second case is going to be how um, expected changes, male dominance, fail to appear. In other words, that we, we're going we're to discover the, the appearance of an ordered regime in one case and be surprised, and in the other case, uh, the absence of an ordered regime that we've all thought was there. Okay? So that's what I'm going to promise, and you can tell me. This is the first time I've given this talk, so you can tell me later whether it makes any sense. So, so if we begin with a butterfly effect, and just to remind you, you've probably all heard about it, but just to remind you how it happened. So Edward Lawrence, 60, what was it, 61, um, looking at his computer output, happens to shut off the computer and then restart it again. He's doing a model of the weather, and uh, the printout actually only contains, what is it, six digital, three decimal places, but the computer is recording more. So he, re, he starts it again, right, and um, puts in those three digits, but he discovers this, that pretty soon those two runs diverge. And he contemplates this and says, well, the conclusion is there's really nothing mechanically forcing those changes. This is really sensitive dependence on initial conditions that he's observing in the case of the weather. And that's the beginning of the story about the butterfly flapping its wings in wherever it is, Brazil, might start a hurricane somewhere else. So we know, you know that butterflies can create chaos, but my first example will be butterflies creating a new regime of order. And women, are the women will be the heroines of this story. Okay, so uh, here's how it goes. 2009, we put together quite a lot of the genetic data that we found. And um, looking at neutral markers, we discovered that one of the largest barriers to human migrations, equivalent to the Sahara or the Himalayas, a very big you know, separation between human populations, occurs in the middle of a chain of islands that have been continuously occupied for probably 50,000 years. So, and here it is, and uh, the question is, why should that be the case? And what you're looking at here is just uh, neutral genetic markers. Let's see if I can get this into, I'm hoping for a pointer, right? So here, this is Asian admixture. So we're looking at how Asian, we can look at markers which are found mostly among Papuan peoples. We can compare those with genetic markers that are found among Chinese people, and we can say, okay, how much admixture, how Papuan or Asian are they? And you'll see here, if I can point to it, there we're looking along the latitude here, excuse me, the longitude across Southeast Asia. These guys are mostly Asian. Those guys are mostly Papuan. In between, not much happening. So one question is, what happened? What caused that, uh, that frontier? In the absence of any kind of physical barrier, there must have been some change in social behavior, right? So this break occurs along the Wallace line, the famous Wallace line, named from Alpha Russell Wallace, which is the, the biogeographical frontier dividing Sunda and Sahel. But we note that it has, although it's an important biogeographical frontier, it's easily crossed by humans. We've been crossing it since you know, 50,000 years ago. So first question is, why is there this barrier, this sharp discontinuity, and a continuous chain of continuously occupied islands that share common languages and cultures. Second question is sex bias. Um, up here you have X chromosomes. So X chromosomes spend twice as much time in women as in men. And here autosomes, those are the ones that we split 50-50, right? That's most of your genes and those get split 50-50. So you'll notice that the X chromosomes are more Asian in that picture. Um, so thus, the Austronesian women's ancestry is more Asian than the men's. So is that a small effect? Well, no, actually, it turns out to be an enormous effect. Here we are looking at, have I got the next slide right? Oops, sorry, okay. Um, and this you need to pay attention, and then the rest of the talk will make sense. Mitochondrial DNA is inherited by children from their mothers. So it's the mother's side, okay? The X, two-thirds of the time in women, one-third third men. Autosomes half from your mother, half from your father. Y chromosome, fathers to their sons, right? So here we see Asian, how Asian are these various genetic systems looking across these islands in eastern Indonesia, and you'll note that the women's DNA is very Asian, and the men, by the time we get out here, they're almost, they're, they've completely been replaced by Papuan. So, what happened? Well, one conclusion is the Austronesian women actually 
made it all the way to Polynesia, but the men didn't. So, you know, did they get tired of them and push them out of the canoe? What, why didn't they get to Hawaii, really? That's the question, okay, in their canoes. Uh, or did the Papuan men slaughter? You can, the geneticists I was working with had all kinds of fanciful theories as to what might have happened to the men. You can make up your own if you like. Um, so that's one question. Second question is near total language replacement. So Austronesian languages were carried by people in these small canoes, um, and they colonized more than half the globe. So these are the spread of Austronesian languages, closely related languages, more than half the globe, the largest expansion of of languages before English, really. But before the modern period, this was the largest expansion and the fastest in the history of the planet. So again, bear in mind this is being carried by small numbers of people moving fast right across the Pacific and even the other direction across the Indian Ocean to Madagascar. Nearly all Pacific Islanders speak languages that are closely related, belonging to the Austronesian language family. Linguists have traced the origins of the Austronesian family to a language spoken on the island of Taiwan about 5,000 years ago. One theory suggests that the Austronesian voyages began from Taiwan. Sailing south, the Austronesians would have reached the islands of the Philippines and then Indonesia. Some sailed on along the coast of Papua and then on into the vast reaches of the Pacific. Right, so. When they began, they were sailing over islands that had already been populated. The first expansion of humans out of Africa, let's see, here we go, get out of Africa about 100,000 years ago, and they get to Australia by 55,000 years ago, more or less, so that means they were really moving pretty fast, and the only way to get to Australia is through the islands of Indonesia, hence there must have been have populated islands here before 55,000 years ago. Very nice islands, right? So the undoubtedly not everyone got to Australia. They would have been continuously occupied, and of course we find archeological evidence. 50,000 years later, we've got these Austronesians arriving, coming from, and this is hotly contested by geneticists and archeologists, exactly where they came from, but essentially they come down from South China via Taiwan or perhaps several different routes, and they move out into the Indonesian archipelago roughly 3,500 years ago, and off they go. We just actually just just got an article accepted for Madagascar. It looks as though the, the Austronesian founding population in Madagascar may have been as few as 30 women, actually. It might have been one boat. Anyway, so off they go. And um, most of these islands thus were populated when the Austronesians arrived. So the third question then is, what happened to the indigenous languages? So our questions are first, why, are there, why is there this barrier? Secondly, why is there a sex bias? And thirdly, what happened to the indigenous languages in the region since people presumably were on them, okay? So those are the questions. So something must have happened to the Austronesians as they traveled through the islands of Indonesia. Was there a change in the organization of their societies? Did women begin to play a more important role? DNA might give us clues, but until now, we have very few DNA samples from Indonesia. That's how this project began. I thought that if we could collect both language and DNA samples from the islands that were the stepping stones for the Austronesian migration, that we might be able to tease out the different histories of men and women. But for that, we would need more samples. In 2000, I met an Indonesian doctor who was already collecting DNA, and we decided to work together. Harawati Sudoyo is the executive director of the Ekman Institute for Molecular Biology in Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia. Hera's goal is to map the genetic diversity of the archipelago and learn about the evolutionary history of tropical diseases. So, we decided that we'd pick up the story on the island of Sumba, this is eastern Indonesia, which was clearly one of the stepping stone islands on the way of the, of, for the Austronesian migration. And it was undoubtedly populated by people tens of thousands of years before the Austronesians arrived. So what happened to the, to the people and the language in Sumba? That was our initial question. By the way, I should say, I'm showing you video clips because this is a talk that wants to turn into a film. We filmed this whole story from, from the year 2000, so we're sort of gradually putting it together into a film. So, uh, Critical comments on that will be also welcomed. 
informasi dalam badan kita atau masing-masing yang membedakan antara satu dengan lain atau membedakan satu suku dengan suku lain itu dengan e, diperiksa DNA-nya namanya itu tadi gennya itu kita bisa melihat sebenarnya asal usulnya mana yang paling tua mana yang paling muda dari situ We're trying to work in parallel While Hera explains our goals and collects the medical data, my job is to reconstruct the history of the Austronesians on Sumba. Was there only one migration to the island? Or were there several at different times? The first question that needs to be answered is, why are there so many languages on this little island? We're in the village of Waimangura in uh, northwest Simba. Public health staff and the team from the Eichmann Institute are collecting health histories, talking about malaria and hepatitis, answering people's questions, and collecting some samples. But I'm going to be asking questions about language. There are eight domains in West Simba, each of which has its own individual language, most of which are unintelligible from one little domain to the other. There's even one region just to the north of here where there's a language that's spoken by people in only three villages. If there was only one Austronesian migration to Sumba, all of these languages should trace back to a single mother language that would have been brought to the island by the first colonists. But it's also possible that there was more than one migration. So we need to collect samples of language variation and use them to reconstruct the history of all the languages of Sumba. This is East Sumba, July 2005. This tape is going to have the third of three tapes containing word lists. We can use changes in the sound patterns of these words to trace the historical relationships between the languages that are now spoken on Sumba. Take the English word to fly. It would be translated differently in each of the languages of Sumba. So far the linguistic evidence suggests that all of the languages of Sumba fall into five regional clusters, and they all derive from a single Austronesian language, which would have been spoken about 3,000 years ago. We can also see that there was not much mixing of languages once the Indonesians settled on the island. That's important for the medical research. It means that small clusters of villages that spoke the same language remained isolated for many centuries, giving time for each population to adapt to local conditions. The next step is to see how that pattern fits with the genetic data. There's a deep connection between language and genes. People tend to choose marriage partners who speak their own language. And over time, that channels the flow of genes. Even though there are lots of languages, it's actually easy for a Sumanese to tell if someone speaks their language. Just look at the clothes they're wearing. The patterns woven into the clothing mark a person's clan and where they're from. The patterns in the cloth will tell you at a glance whether someone belongs to a clan that you're allowed to marry and what language they're likely to speak. But occasionally, people marry strangers, and that will bring different genes into a village. And sometimes people learn new languages. So languages in DNA can travel different paths down through the centuries. By gathering samples of both words and genes from many villages, we're hoping to retrace those journeys into the past. So the, the first result from Sumba. This is haplogroup O, so that's a marker for the Austronesian people. 
Okay, it's distinct from the Papuan, that's Asian if you like. And here's the percentage of the Austronesian cognate. So these are the words that were present in the original language, Proto-Austronesian, that are still retained. So you see there's a, there's a relationship here of retention of both the Austronesian words and the genes. And on Sumba, that uh, highest retention is in the west, which happens to be the part of the island that is also the nicest. It's the wettest, okay? There's the most vegetation if you're a tribal person. Sumbanese believe that their ancestors arrived in the northernmost tip of the island at a place called Cape Wunga. Here's Wunga on the north coast, the driest piece of land in all of Indonesia. The Austronesian colonists brought their genes and their languages with them. When we started this research, it was thought that the Austronesians moved out in a great wave, replacing or blending with the people who were there before. But our new data tell a different story. Austronesian genes are found in small clumps, and the same is true of their languages. Today, some villages have retained a lot of Austronesian words in their local dialect, but others have not. So here's what we think might have happened. Sumba was already populated by hunter-gatherers. They would have been concentrated in the west, where there's more rainfall. The Austronesians arrive, build their village, and as their population grows, begin to create new villages. The villages in the west would have been surrounded by indigenous peoples speaking different languages. As the two groups intermarried, the proportion of Austronesian words and genes would gradually fall off. But in the east, the Austronesian villages would have been more isolated and retain more of their original genes and language. Today, the culture of Sumba is dominated by men. But we know that in the past, at some point, women played a much more important role. So when and where did that change begin? On the island of Flores, just to the north of Sumba, there are said to be some matrilineal villages where descent is traced through the female line and women have a lot of power. Could those villages be relics from the time when the Austronesian culture began to change and women assumed more power? We decided to go to Flores and take a look. The village of Bena in the mountains of central Flores looks a lot like the villages in Sumba. We've got the houses with the tall thatched roofs and the stone tombs to the ancestors just in front of them. But there's an important difference. The villages in Sumba are patrilineal, the men are in charge, whereas here this village is matrilineal. It means that the houses are owned by women, that both men and women inherit their rights to property through their mothers, and so the, the matriline is stronger here. This could be important because the genetic data from the Pacific suggests that the Austronesian voyagers might have been a matrilineal society. The question we want to ask is, what difference does it make? Biasanya, Bapak, kalau uh, yang diturunkan dengan berdasarkan ibu, yeah. itu warisan biasanya diberikan lebih banyak kepada anak perempuan. Misalnya. Nah, apakah di sini juga terjadi hal seperti itu? Ya memang ini sudah turun temurun sejak dari kami punya orang tua. Ya. Tapi yang perang adalah perempuan, sedangkan bagaimana perempuan itu untuk pengeluaran atau omong apa-apa, kita harus satukan dengan saudara-saudara orang tuanya itu. In Bena, women have a lot of power. It's one of a handful of matrilineal villages where women own things like livestock and land, and children inherit from their mothers. When we analyzed the genetic samples from Bena, we learned that the matrilineal villages on Flores are only a few hundred years old. So the genetic samples from Bena are much too recent to tell us anything about the Austronesian voyagers. But there's still another chance. On the island of Timor, just to the south of Flores, deep in the interior, there's another cluster of matrilineal villages. And there's reason to believe that these villages are very old, much older than the matrilineal villages on Flores. Oops. All right. uh, we're almost finished with the films. You need to visit Wehali, and then we'll get into mathematics. OK, so here we are in, in Sumba, patrilineal. And there is Timor. And here in Timor is Wehali. So this is an ancient cluster of matrilineal villages. We're interested in them because we're wondering about the role of women in the Austronesian expansion. 
Here in Wehali, men still think of themselves as warriors. But as in all matrilineal societies, they share power with women. There are written records from the colonial era that prove that Wehali was a matrilineal center before the first Europeans arrived in the islands 400 years ago. In the center of the innermost village, there's a sacred dwelling for the female rulers of Wehali. In the 17th century, the Portuguese were vying for control of this part of Indonesia. And in 1642, they sent an expedition here to, to destroy the kingdom of Wehali. But uh, after burning down the buildings, they left. The buildings were undefended. And nothing changed. The reason is Wehali is not organized like a European kingdom. Here, women rule. The lady to my side here is an Imed, means she is the ruler of Wehali. The lady to my side here is an Imed, means she is the ruler of Wehali. So literally dozens of villages will send delegates here if she calls them. This is a matrilineal society, so it means that women own land and property, and so she is the one who ultimately has the choice, the decision to make about how that land and that property will be allocated. I want to lie. In this matrilineal society, there are no patrilineal clans. That makes a big difference in the way the genes flow down through the centuries. The mitochondrial DNA, which everyone inherits from their mother, stays in the community. In the islands of the Pacific, that's the pattern that we see. The genes tell us that the Austronesian women remained together and sailed all the way to the furthest islands. But what happened to the men? Well, here in Wehali, we might have a model. In other words, they have a myth that the world was an ocean, and then people settled on that in a small island which gradually grew. Now, suppose that were something like the truth. In other words, these voyagers arrive on an island. They establish uh, a settlement there. The women stay put. The women inhabit these villages. And they marry with the local men. And then eventually, they send out daughter settlements to the next island. And that way, they could sort of hopscotch. They could hopscotch across the Pacific. And in the end, you'd get the pattern that we see which would mean that the original Austronesian voyagers, the whole expansion could have been driven by matrilineal societies. When we analyzed the DNA from all the islands, it confirmed what we discovered in Wehali. About 3,000 years ago, Austronesian voyagers from Taiwan reached the islands of eastern Indonesia, which were already populated by Papuan hunter-gatherers. The Austronesians built new matrilocal villages, just like Wehali, Soon, Papuan men began to marry into the Austronesian villages. Their children would grow up in their mother's village, speaking her Austronesian language and carrying her Taiwanese DNA. But these children would also inherit Papuan DNA from their fathers. And that's exactly the genetic pattern that we see, right across eastern Indonesia and all the way out into the Pacific as far as Hawaii. So, very simple model in which you Papuan men marry into these matrilineal, matrilocal villages. If you think about it, that means the children will grow up with their father's Papuan DNA, their mother's Asian mitochondrial DNA, and they'll speak their mother's tongue. So here's a very simple model. Following that um, logic, we ask, what kind of rate of in-marriage would be required over what period of time to cause this change? And the answer is surprising, 2% in marriage from those outlying Papuan communities, over 50 generations. And we have about 120 generations to play with here. And you get a pattern like that. That's the model. And there's the data.
and you're supposed to be interested because these are all independent genetic systems. So that's as simple a model as I've ever built. Okay. Um, that accounts then for um, the dominance of Austronesian languages and the transition in the genetics across the Indo-Pacific. So over tens of thousands of years, in other words, of generations, excuse me, tens of generations, let's back up, tens of generations, this small bias, this occasional you know, willingness to bring in a Papuan husband is enough to account for that change. It may not be how it happened, but it does fit the data rather well. So the next question then is, well, then what happened to these matrilineal societies? Because most Aust Indonesian tribal societies today are patrilineal and patrilocal. So you have to ask what became of the women. Um, and that takes us to anthropology. This is Claude Levi-Strauss, who uh, in the 80s came up with a model which he called Society à Maison, a house society. He noticed that houses, and by this he means something like the, the, the house of usher, in other words, a noble house, may preserve itself by creating alliances with other houses. And it really doesn't matter whether they're to matrilineal or patrilineal houses, as long as you create an, you know, a politically effective alliance. So in Austronesia, we find literally houses, these big thatched roofs, which are the clan houses, where intermarriage is the rule. And uh, Van Wouden, a Dutch archaeologist, noticed in the 30s that in general, we find both matrilineal and patrilineal societies across the islands, really. In most cases, you have, you have both. So the notion here is that it might have been possible for houses to shift back and forth between matrilineal or patrilineal exchanges. So if it's matrilocal, that means the women stay put. You'll have less diversity of women, more men kind of being pulled in. Patrilocal residents would be the opposite. But a house society would be one in which they can switch easily between both kinds. So here we can take, uh, we can ask a, whether this makes sense from a genetic point of view. If, if you take my DNA, you can take the DNA of me and the other people in my village. Let's take the men, OK? And from the Y chromosomes, you can calculate the effective population size of the males. In other words, how many men were required to produce the genetic diversity of Y chromosomes that we see in the village today? You can do the same thing on the female side with the mitochondrial DNA. And the beauty of this is you're taking the DNA from the same people. It's the same men whose ancestry you're tracing through both the father's side and the mother's side. So here we see the difference between the uh, mitochondrial effective population size, in other words, how many female ancestors were required to create this village, and here are the Y chromosomes. So this is how many male ancestors were required to create that population. And you'll notice that it's pretty continuous. OK, this is the log scale. We see continuous variation. We don't see two clumps. If there was, you know, if the choice was either be patrilocal or be patrilocal forever, then they'd look like that. Then instead, what we see is this alternation along these villages. So it looks as though this sort of sliding pattern of houses may have persisted for, for some time. Okay, so with this, we say, ah, oh, look, uh, this tiny change in marriage patterns then, organized by houses, can create this enormous change, really, in the history of the Pacific. But Levi-Strauss claimed that there was no inherent trajectory to the evolution of the house societies. He had no opinion on that point. And in Lawrence's butterfly model, what we see is initially tiny variation can change, creating a, a more chaotic regime. But here, what I'm calling alpha, this marriage rate, iterated over tens of generations, produces a new regime of order in which language and kinship and genetics all change. OK, so where are we? Well, this explains two of our questions. That is the progressive sex bias in the genes, and also the spread of the Austronesian languages. But it doesn't actually explain the, the barrier, the first question that I, that I posed to you. That is, why, are there, why is there this sharp discontinuity in the Asian or Papuan ancestry along the Wallace line? So for that, we need to go to Bali. Okay. Interesting thing about Bali, this barrier in other words, the big drop-off in Asian ancestry begins just to the east of the island of Bali. So what's special about Bali? Well, the Balinese have been growing rice in irrigated terraces since the 9th century. 
And the thing about these rice terraces is the people who live in them get to be very stable. They're very permanent populations. Once you've built your rice-growing village, there's not much incentive to migrate, to move over and you know, find an alliance from, from people in a, in a more distant land. Tribal societies, the, on the islands to the east, the house societies do move around quite a lot. They create alliances, and the patterns are more diverse. But in Bali, people stay put. So this is, a, this is endogamy within subaks. A subak is a collection of farmers who live in the same village and share the same irrigation. Uh, society. We have inscriptions referring to them from the 11th century on. So let's say we've had a thousand years of people living in these subaks. Turns out they've been marrying each other's daughters at a rate of about average 85 percent. Okay? So they are extremely endogamous. And what that does is to bring population movement to a standstill. Everybody marries the girl next door. You do that generation after generation and population movement stops. So where do the Balinese fall on this scale? Right there. There's no bias. They're nominally patrilocal. In other words, you bring in women, move into their husband's family, but their husband's family is not going to be in a distant house in another village. It's going to be right next door. Okay? So that stops movement. It just brings population movement to a halt in Bali for 20 generations. So that, we think, is what led to the sharp split that begins just to the east of Bali. OK, so nobody, apparently nobody wanted to leave Bali, <laughs> which is still a problem, okay. so the Balinese say. OK, so I'm going to go back to my butterflies. Little changes in marriage patterns may have transformed the languages and the genetics, the whole social structure of the, of the Indo-Pacific. And that fact about marriage got us interested in romance. Would you rather kiss on your very last chance of another start? And how would you rise again on a difficult slope with a broken heart? Small decisions, life incisions, big and retrospect. Racing gently, consequently, no matter my effort. Couldn't resist. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Here's our transition. Okay, so um, thinking about romance, final question. Probably the most uh, popular foundational theory, if you like, in human behavioral ecology is that men compete for status and that, that there is a fitness effect. So here's Bobby Lowe and uh, her summary of the evidence for this idea. She says, in more than 100 well-studied societies, clear, formal, reproductive rewards for men are associated with status. In other words, high-ranking men have the right to more wives and more children. So that will have an evolutionary effect, right? This is cultural evolution. The idea is men compete for status, and the reward for status is having more kids. And her evidence, those 100 or so well-studied societies, is demographic evidence. She looked at uh, graveyards in Sweden, mostly, and looked at the frequency, you know, do high-ranking men tend to have more children? Do they live longer? Is there an effect? Is that the reward for status competition? So we wondered about that effect because that would produce a strong directional change in marriage patterns. And we've got our 41 villages, so we can ask whether we actually see that effect, right? Would there be, a, would there be the effect of a change in which the butterfly beats start to flap in the same direction and the high-ranking men have more offspring. So we'd be shifting from looking at demographic effects that you can trace by looking at graveyards for a generation or two or three to the genetic evidence when we can look over much longer spans of time. So uh, where are we now? Here's the question then. Does the status competition that we indeed see among men, even in Indonesia, have any lasting effect? Does it have a lasting effect? Is there an, a lasting effect, meaning an evolutionary effect, meaning a change in the population characteristics? Right? That's the question. Do we see a definite shape appearing, or do the butterflies of love create a more chaotic relationship? OK, so our, our data allows us to retrace the history of love, if you like, for 10 to 15 generations. In, and we finished this now for 41 of the villages across it's about six of the different islands to ask this question. So let me tell you how we, how we analyze it. Question, the possibilities first are 
Okay, we could have strong dominance, in which case high-ranking males would have more children, and over time you'd see that. So if it were the Lansings who were dominant, then you'd see a lot of Lansings in the village, right? After a few generations. It could also be neutral, in which case everybody has an equal probability of having children. That then will lead to the frequency of haplotypes. Or finally, it could be a red queen competition. So, so what's a red queen? Well, uh, in Alice in Wonderland, Alice tells, excuse me, the Red Queen tells Alice that sometimes you have to run as fast as you can just to stay in the same place, okay? And Van Valen, a theoretical ecologist, said, well, what this translated into ecology, this is fluctuating dominance. Everybody races, it can be an arms race, but nobody gets ahead for very long. So that could be true too, right? You could have competition. In Sumba, for example, the men carry swords, many of them. And they are very interested in how many wives they have. There is definitely status competition. The question is, does anybody actually get ahead long enough for this to have a change in the population history of the villages that they occupy? So uh, the way we can track that question or ask that question is by looking at the Y chromosome, which men pass on to their, to their sons, and trace patrilineal descent. So here's me. Here's my Y chromosome. And uh, oops, there are some cousins. You track, basically, you just look at neutral genetic markers. Microsatellites mutate at a regular rate, and if there are the, the more mutations that have occurred between you and me, the more distantly we are, we are related. So in this way, we can track the history of patrilines, patrilineal descent groups. So here we are in the village of Cody. So here's a village in Cody. And haplotypes, then, we can think of them as male descent groups. So here on the left is the number of men who, are, who have a unique patri patriline. It means that they are the only one of their kind. There's only one Lansing in that village, and there's only one Smith and only one Brown. These are unique ones, OK? At the far end over here, we have the most common haplotype. The Vanderleos have taken over this village. So these are the Vanderleos, OK? So we're looking just at the frequency distribution of male descent groups in the village, right? Village by village. Clear enough? So there are a lot of, lot of those. Do you mind, Sondra? These are your people, right? The 23 Mondaleos in, that, in the village of Cody, whereas those guys are unique. It's exactly the same techniques that's used to look at community assemblages in, in ecology. And in fact, it's the same technique that Kimura developed for looking at neutral distributions in genetics long ago. But we need, anyway, for the moment, that's all we need to know is this is a way to look at whether, dom whether there are changes in the population uh, history of the village. So if we assume that these patrilines are competing, here's, here's years. We can do some simulations and give them an average uh, advantage. We can create some advantageous patrilines, right, that are higher status and give them an advantage ranging from 0 to 10%, and just ask, how long does it take before uh, they become dominant in the village? You'll notice that it takes rather a long time. We're talking about a time scale of centuries, and we've got quite a few to play with. So, Eventually, however, if there's no, if there are new, new ones coming in, then only one will be left. Okay. Um, here's what we actually see. Here are a bunch of these villages. I probably should have organized this better, but these are little snapshots of haplotype distributions within villages in Sumba. And the interesting thing about it is that uh, all of them are neutral. In no case do we find evidence for male dominance. And we would see it within the last 10 to 15 generations. So that means even if there was a short period of time in which the Lansings became dominant in that village, we'd see that, okay? So it's a pretty interesting and sensitive test for asking, do we ever see even pulses of dominance occurring in these villages or not? So here's just a simulation. Uh, and to make sense of this, so haplotypes are defined by a string of things called microsatellites. And as soon as one of them mutates, it's a new haplotype, okay? So we get innovation from either new ones mutating, which happens pretty fast, or migrants, new people come into the village. So new people come in, but then just by random chance, from time to time, somebody dies out, right? One group will die out. So you have a drift mutation equilibrium. And in this case, what we're calculating is starting with one haplotype, over time, we see the creation of new ones. This is just by mutation. Every now and then, a bit flip produces a slightly different one. So we count it as different, OK? Here, here we are moving up. So this population is going until finally they equilibrate after about 25 generations. Okay. Here we've got the same simulation. In this case, we begin with 200 different haplotypes. Every one is different. 
but it rapidly declines, and once again, we reach an equilibrium, okay? From a biologist's point of view, that's pretty fast, but from an anthropologist's point of view, 25 generations is a long time, okay? A long time in which to look back into the past and ask, do we see departures from this neutral state, okay? So uh, that's it, really, here we are. Here's neutrality, and do we see anybody that is not at neutrality? And the answer is, Yes, in one case we do, but it's a village where there are migrants who come in because it's where the civil service is headquartered. So those guys don't count, okay? And actually they have more diversity rather than less diversity. So once again, there's no evidence for dominance in that village, okay? Whoever's the head of the, whoever is the mayor of the village now, he's evidently not gonna pass that on to his great grandson. Okay, so why is this interesting? Well. For just in terms of butterfly effect, they, they expected, I was surprised by this result because I'd read all the, the you know, the, it's, it's the sort of the foundational idea in behavioral ecology that there's a strong selection effect, we're all competing for status, and that is translated into reproduction, right? So that's what we expected to see. It is not what we saw, it's not what we saw. So we looked again, but we still can't see it. So it's, it's in effect, it looks like a red queen effect. All right, so those butterflies are flocking in different ways and we're creating a chaotic system where we expected order to occur, right? Um, deeply upsetting to many of my colleagues, <laughs> this result, okay? But it has a silver lining. And the silver lining is, here we're looking at the, the time to the most recent common ancestor. So you take a bunch of, uh, you know, we collect all the people who have the same haplotype and we look at the differences between them and we ask how long ago did they share a common ancestor using the molecular clock and the microsatellites. So here are some of those numbers. Here's, you know, see these are Y chromosome uh, haplogroups, 36,000 years, 33,000 years, 37,000 years, that's a long time. Now if you think about, you know, how these genes are kind of traveling down through the centuries, small boats and then small villages. Right, these are small groups of people carrying those genes, dispersed into small villages, drift, accident, all kinds of reasons why they could disappear quickly. And they would also disappear very quickly. If there was a strong male dominance effect, then pretty soon we'd just have Wes and Lansings and Van der Leos, and the rest of you would disappear, because we're the dominance, right? <laughs> right? So, or whoever would become dominant. But we're, so in other words, the fact that dominance does not seem to play a role in these villages over longer time scales, probably is, you know, here is an explanation then for the preservation of diversity over tens of thousands of years in these genetic combinations. Remember that they're packaged in small groups. They're, they're, they're going down through the centuries in, um, in small villages. So that's that story. So I'm winding up now uh, with the conclusion that we're seeing two global patterns. Again, what I've been trying to talk about is the relationship between these local scale phenomena, like who people marry, basically it's all about romance, and the global effects that we see cascading down through the centuries. So the first of them, the one we've just concluded with, is these patrilines, we're not claiming that they don't compete for social dominance, it's just that they don't succeed for very long. That's what the DNA is telling us, they're not succeeding. So there's no evolutionary effect, and that's important. In other words, there's no payoff in the long run the, the, the composition of patrilines or haplogroups in the villages doesn't change, okay? which means no evolutionary effect. Right? So what we see here, instead of the dominance effect, is rather just equilibrium or, in a sense, chaos. Right? So that was surprising. And uh, the second is sort of the opposite, right? The first story I told you, which is that 2% change in women's choice of husband got them to Hawaii with their languages and their children and changed the history of the Indo-Pacific. It also changed thus not only the language but also the culture of the Indo-Pacific. It became the, the dominance of Austronesian language, culture, social structure, and genetics. If this is correct, at least I'm surprised, all of that could have happened from a kind of a butterfly effect, right? I mean, just a, a small change in, in marriage patterns could have achieved that effect. Again, we don't know that it happened that way, but uh, it's consistent with the story I've just told you. So that's the story, and these are many colleagues who've been involved in this, uh, and I'll just acknowledge that I'm a small part in a large machine. 
So thank you very much. Sure, I can. So we can yeah. just start, please. Yeah. I'm I'm curious about the the Papuans. Um, mm -hmm. The the um, the two percent intermarriage rate uh, into the the. Um, can't keep everybody straight. Austronesian villages. Into the Austronesian villages had the effect on the Austronesian villages. Presumably, there was a, also a, a, an outmarriage rate into the Papuan villages. Did the Papuan villages persist, or did they eventually uh, fail to, to compete, or are they, are they still around? Or are they They're still around, and on different islands you see, for example, in, around Wehali, remember the Wehali case? There are people who speak Papuan languages who are, identify as Papuans who occasionally marry, and so this actually still continues in Central Timor. In other islands like Sumba, it seems to have ended, but if you look back, if you look back at the genetic and language, what we see then is the admixture happening, but not to the, there, there are still Papuan words and genes in Sumba, but there are not distinct populations of Papuans or Papuan language anymore. Whereas in, in, in Timor, which is larger, that process is ongoing. So you, you could kind of predict that the Austronesian, the Austronesian expansion is going on, it continues. It didn't end 3,000 years ago. It's still happening in, on the island of Timor, and in another 1,000 years, it'll probably be complete. Right? It's an ongoing process. That's what this would, that would be consistent with this evidence. Jeffrey. Uh, I have a pretty simplistic question, which may illustrate that I didn't understand what you said. But why is it, given this, that these men still continue to brandish swords and compete? I mean, what is the evolutionary uh, pressure <laughs> that is leading to that? And, and conversely, in the matrilineal villages, are the women brandishing swords against one another and acting in a more <laughs> aggressive way? Uh, so the women don't, I'll start with it, the women don't brandish swords, right? They're, but do they have, you know, I meant that metaphorically, I mean. Right, they're they, no, right. They are. Are they competing with one another in this uh, kind of pathetic way that men typically do? <laughs> uh, no, I mean, these, they're structured with, with clan position determines who you are. These are, these, are, these are ranked societies. And so it's an inherited position, right? In the matri matrilineal, matrilocal cases, the ones that we still know about. Um, so there's not a big difference there. The men, though, I mean, the reason, the reason this is interesting to anthropologists, this result, is it, you can easily make up a story to say, why do men compete? Well, imagine that men did compete for status and that success in status led to having more children. They could pass that on to their children. Then you have an evolutionary process that could select for aggression, right? Or whatever it takes to become dominant. And so that has been sort of the accepted wisdom in human behavioral ecology until now, really. I mean, this, and this isn't going to Bring, it, this raises that question, right? What else is going on? I don't have an answer for it. I think, to me, we can actually, I didn't get into the details of this, we can actually detect a red queen effect. So it looks like it is, or even in other words, genetically, looking at the, at the haplotype frequencies, we can distinguish between, you know, pure uh, right, equilibrium, equal chance, red queen, or dominance, and what we see is it looks more like a red queen effect, which means that I get ahead for a generation, I pass it on to my sons, he, they may, may pass it on to their grandsons, and then it washes out and somebody else becomes dominant, right? So it shortens the, it just, it just changes the time frame a little bit. That's what it actually looks like. You still have, so we all keep running, the guys keep running, but we just don't, there, we can no longer rely on an evolutionary explanation for why we do the things we do. <laughs> Yeah, that's the implication. And, and as a follow-up, is there any, are there any studies, any comparative studies of primates kind of vaguely along these lines, or could you imagine doing them? Uh, well, the of, question of, of primate of, social groups. Right, well, it, dominance in primates has been a, you know, right. almost studied to death, right? And in right. fact, that we, we carry with us evidence that dominance is important. We have sexual dimorphism in all mammals. If you have dimorphism, meaning the males are larger than the females or vice versa, 
That is the signature of a dominance hierarchy. We're still dimorphic. So there has been in our past, right, there has been uh, competition, right? There's been, there, males compete for reproductive success. That's true of, you know, lots of mammals. And it was true of our ancestors and to the extent that we're still dimorphic, right? So this, I'm not, I don't have a new theory. I just have a, a problem with the old one, really. I mean, that what, we, what we discovered is surprising given, given what, the way we think this has worked in the past. Um, Sander. One thing that at least I didn't catch you talking about a lot is are there any marriage rules in the sense of out marriage from a client? You mentioned that at one point, mm -hmm. that there may be even more specific rules within clans is one of the things I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. The other thing is if there is no long-term effect, is that due to the fact that the social structure in the village or in various villages, actually has particular characteristics why you don't have long-term inheritance of that social structure. Well, but wait, the, the social structure is maintained. I mean, they have, these okay. are exogamous uh, uh, clans, generally. Yeah. And so they, and they form nice patterns over Indonesia. In other words, these are tribal societies that have usually positive rules of marriage. You're supposed to marry, if not a cousin, then at least somebody who belongs okay. to a different okay. named group. You okay. can tell by the clothes they're wearing, you know, who they're supposed to marry. So that's all tightly organized, and that's how alliances are made between clans. So that continues. This is looking just sort of drilling down to the next level. Yeah. What about competition among men within them? But the, uh, the, the, the reasons for marriage having to do with alliance between clans, this doesn't question that at all. No, okay. Yeah. All right. and then the other thing is your time clock. What yeah. is that dependent on? Is that a genetic time clock? Yeah, what kind this of time is clock just, is it? these are microsatellites or yeah. short tandem repeats. If maybe you're interested because everybody's going to have to know this for your medical history, right, in a few years. So these are just stretches of junk, right? These are stretches of DNA that have no particular function. So these little stretches of junk can repeat. And because they have no functional effect, they can, they can double or triple, or they can triple and then go back to double. And they do this at a, at a rate, and if you look at enough of them, and they're all kind of ticking at a neutral rate, then you can get a kind of an arbitrarily accurate clock by looking at enough things that are ticking, right, to estimate time back to the time when, uh, you know, how many ticks have happened since the divergence has occurred. It's neutrality. Vivian, yeah. Um, yeah. I have a question uh, coming back to the dominance and the male haplotype. Yes. Um, isn't, um, isn't there some kind of conflation here when in fact uh, the, the male haplotype is a marker for a particular lineage, but dominance really is an expression of the whole, of the whole male? So um, basically, I'm not quite sure how the particular haplotype actually relates to the dominance itself. It doesn't have to be located on the Y chromosome just like hemophiliac isn't related on the Y chromosome right. either. Yeah, well, these, see, the thing is, these aren't, we're not talking about genes or genes for dominance, anything like that. We're just, we're just identifying uh, male descent groups because I got my haplotype from my father and he from his. So I can, you can, you, it's like painting me with a color, right? I'm a, I'm a blue and you're a red. It's nothing to do with genes. It's just, it's just lines of descent that are marked because, because Y chromosomes happen to go from fathers to sons. So you just say, which, you know, which Y chromosome are you carrying, right? That's all, that's, that's what we're saying. But I mean, that's important to, to make that point, right? Yeah, so basically, uh, you can mark the lines of descent, but you're not actually marking dominance with it. No, 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 we're, we're just marking a line of descent. And then, but then second question is, so do, do, do we then see an overabundance of some particular haplotypes, right? Do, they, do some of them become more or less frequently than what happened by pure chance? So we calculate what would, be the, what would be the distribution based on chance, and then we say, do we see an excess of guys who thus must have been dominant for some reason? And, but since we see no such divergence from equilibrium, we don't need to make up stories about dominance. There's no evidence that any group ever achieves dominance long enough for it to be registered in the population. Therefore, we, the dominance question kind of goes out the window. So, sort of. I mean, my, my, my concern was that the dominance isn't actually located on the thing that you're tracking, which is the Y chromosome, the haplotype. So you're tracking the, the particular dominant, uh, the, what do you call it, the frequency of the Y chromosome of that particular haplotype, but the dominance that you are comparing it to isn't necessarily located on that 
Right, but I'm, see, I'm not claiming that, that there is a gene for dominance or that we're looking at anything to do with dominance. I'm just asking, do we see evidence that there has been dominance? The effect of dominance in this case would be a differential reproductive success, right? And we can just count those up. It's just counting up and say, do we see differential reproductive success? Do some guys become more fecund than others? And does that persist? So it, it's, it's just, you know, it's like the, it's, it's the question that if we said, if the answer was yes, then we move on to say why, you know, what is it about dominance? Is there some behavioral, is there something genetic? We can ask all those questions, but we don't, we're not entitled to do so because we don't see any dominance at all in the first place, right? Is that? Uh, okay. All right, well, we, thanks. Yes, uh, Steve, I don't know if I missed something, but I heard you to say that uh, Australian women marry a few Papuan men, maybe 2%, uh, and produce mixed children who speak in Austronesian. But I didn't hear you explaining what happened to the majority of the Papuan men who married Papuan women, produced Papuan children, who presumably spoke Papuan. And I didn't hear also the second part of the story. How did those mixed children who speak Austronesian come to overwhelm the purely Papuan population? Oh, uh, you're right. I should just, it's because the Austronesians bring the Neolithic. They bring population explosion, right? The Papuans were hunters and gatherers, very low population density. The Aust Austronesians bring with them the toolkit that enables their population to grow by a couple of orders of magnitude. So their numbers increase, and the Papuans don't, at any rate, not at the same rate. There's still, but again, you know, look at the, the data from Simba, there's still Papuans in the population, but this cultural, see, that's what's interesting, right? It's this cultural process of creating large numbers of children who grew up in an Austronesian-speaking village with Austronesian culture, pretty soon that takes over without, you know, peacefully, right? The Papuans are still there, but gradually their children are differentially becoming Austronesians, and so gradually there's a transition in the society, in the language and the culture of the whole island, island after island. I mean, that's the other thing that's interesting about this. We've got not a few villages, we've got island after island in which we see these this transition. What's surprising, I mean, we got into this question because Peter Bellwood, a great archaeologist of this region, asked years ago, whatever happened to the indigenous languages? You know, there must have been indigenous languages all over these islands, just to the south of Singapore, right? What happened to them? How, did, how, did, how were they replaced, right? And uh, this, this is this simple little model that would, will produce that result, right? Something like this must have happened. I mean, if I'll say this, if you compare to other regions of the world, Austronesian took over a vast region, right? If you go to Africa, South America, other parts of the world, you see language admixture, you see the preservation of lots of different language families, right? Clumps of languages. But across these islands, there's just a sort of sweep of uh, Austronesian. So that's the question, how could that, how could that have occurred? And oh, my, my dear friend and colleague, the geneticist, Michael Hammer, was convinced that the Papuans there must have been bloody battles, right, between the males. So no need for that in our model. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for the interesting talk. And uh, wh when you're showing the picture with the map, when they're spreading all these tribes near just the vast areas of the Pacific Ocean, uh, I was curious why they didn't go to Australia again. I mean, because Australia was uncovered, right? And I mean, all the all the islands on the north. Mm -hmm. I mean, was it just densely po populated by by previous tribes, or what was the reason? I, I just, what do you think? Uh, the short answer, I think, and this is much debated by the prehistorians. Where they're looking to see how many, how how much, uh, who were the people who populated Australia and so forth. The short answer, and I'll just I'll just say, is it, it's not a particularly hospitable coastline when you when you're sailing over from Timor from south. Whereas if you go up, if, in other words, if you go north and along the coast of Melanesia and into Micronesia, then it's very easy, it's very attractive. One can see how, bear in mind that these are small numbers of people. These are, these are villages that grow and gradually expand and eventually send off a daughter settlement. So they're doing that rather rapidly and they had their choice, right, as to which island they choose. So they apparently simply chose northern Melanesia, the coast, and continued on out past the Trobriens into uh, into Polynesia. Though, of course, they paused for a while. It took them about a thousand years to invent Polynesian culture, and then they continued on and made it to Tahiti. Right. Madagascar is extraordinary, right? That, that they got to Madagascar. Again, we've just got this genetic data which says 
mitochondrial DNA, the mothers again, looks like the effective population size of 30 would create the diversity that we see. Now, that's just a first result, and it comes from three villages. It may be that that's wrong. It may be that that's wrong, because we haven't got a lot of genetic samples from, from Madagascar. But it does show how rapidly this kind of process of Neolithic, they were great colonizers. And actually, also, uh, Madagascar is very interesting, because you see these houses and the megalithic shrines, a lot of the, the culture, a lot of the Austronesian culture made it on these little fragile boats somehow. You know, it's, it's, it's extraordinary, really, that such limited contact could have such a profound effect across so far, you know, such a, such a span of ocean. I'm kind of an Austronesian enthusiast, actually, having. <laughs> uh, so your, your study raises some very interesting um, uh, questions about uh, uh, doing genetics in, in uh, indigenous or in, in, in small human populations. And, and you mentioned the HapMap studies and, and the yep. other kind of really large scale, uh, you know, catalogs of human genetic variation that are, that are, are driven by different, um, driven by different questions. I mean, in part by medical, in part uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, to reconstruct human populations. But, but there's still this sensitivity about doing, um, Doing genetic studies in indigenous populations, and, and I think in, in your case it's fascinating because it's it's sort of tied so intimately to their to their history. And so, do do these populations see this work in a in a, a positive way, or are they neutral to to um, the, the fact that you've sourced DNA from them and, and studied that? Uh, well, this can, was... can this be a positive role model for for a broader range of? Uh, can I ask you to comment on that, Saharina? Because at the moment, you're the head of the, the Human Subjects Review Board, I think, at Ekman, Uni Ekman Institute. Or you have been. And Ekman Institute has responsibility for all genetic research in Indonesia. So. Sorry, could you um, repeat your questions again? Uh, I, I guess, I mean, um, it, it was really a question about, uh, I mean, I guess it had several components. One is that, that collectively we're spending huge amounts of money documenting genetic variation to an unprecedented <coughs> level in a, in a relatively small group of, of populations, so Western Europeans, uh, Han Chinese, uh, West uh, Africans. And I mean, those, those studies are starting to uh, look at, at um, smaller uh, populations and, and more indigenous populations. But there's still this kind of sensitivity in genetics to to studying these groups and, and in, in a case of in terms of ethics but but also I think the the I mean for the last fifty years um, you know any, any question of, of, of studying genetics and race has this kind of tainted you know history for good reason. Um, and, and so it's interesting in this case that your the genetics is, is intimately bound up with the other data about the history of the of these local populations and, and so I just I guess commenting or, or asking if um, this has a broader, um, a broader impact into making such studies uh, appear in a more positive light in the future. Okay. So, okay. Um, the study with Steve is only part of the study that we have done. We are connecting or we are associating this with uh, disease susceptibility. So, when we go out to the field, um, when we ask for um, ethical approval from our ethic, uh, IRB um, in our institution, it's not, the question is not whether we would be able to see the, the migration, the history, the peopling, the population structures. It's not, that, uh, it's not only that question that we are asking. We are also asking about, like for example, the uh, Southeast Asians are the endemic, uh, the, uh, endemic area for malaria. And there are so many um, red blood cells, polymorphism or disorder or membrane variations that connected as a response of coevolution with the malaria parasites, which is not advantageous in the modern society. So we also study that. And uh, if you're asking me um, in, uh, in um, whether we will have, we were able to give back something to the community? Uh, yeah. yeah. In how they perceive the study. In, in okay, so we are very um, um, huge population, more than 230 million people, uh, 17,000 islands, 700 
more than 700 uh, languages, more than five, 400 uh, ethnic groups. So it's not an easy task. So um, what we could do, could do is, um, first of all, to study the major populations, but uh, also small population like what Steve has done. But we also studied the um, susceptibility to um, malaria. We also studied the uh, variation of the red blood cell disorder, which is also has been um, the, the interest of, with Mike Hammer of mm -hmm. our group, because, uh, for example, when you are a carrier of thalassemia and you're going to marry someone which is also a carrier, but from different type of um, uh, mutations, for example, that doesn't mean that you are safe, your children will be safe, because then you will, uh, your children would have a chance to develop a compound heterozygote, which, is, uh, which will have effect later on in their lives. So that's kind of thing that after more um, than 15 years we are studying the red blood cell disorder, now we are able to give advice to our government, to the, um, to the uh, Ministry of Health, so they would think how to handle the thalassemia problem, for example. That's one, uh, one uh, example. The other example is we also, besides studying the genetics, it's not purely genetics only, we also study the hepatitis B virus uh, spread. The hepatitis B virus uh, genotypes, now we know um, the, 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 the spread is similar to my, the mitochondrial DNA spread. So we, now we know um, the hepatitis B in Indonesia is more uh, infected from vertically from mother to daughter. That's, that's one example. And also hepatitis C, how you handle uh, the, the medication, etc. So when a, a, a thalassemic parent came to us and asked for a prenatal diagnosis, first, uh, the first question we will ask is, what ethnic are you? That could sound like racism or something, but that's very important for us because then we would be able to uh, screen for the mutation, we would be able to give advice, genetic advice, how to handle uh, the children later on. Does that answer your question? Uh, maybe I'll just say one more thing, too. We, we, I didn't talk about the medical results, but the same argument about language and, and kinship also, we think, applies to medicine. In other words, the, right, the point of these large the HapMap, the thousand genomes, is to do association studies at the global scale, right, of uh, diseases with, with, uh, with uh, resistance markers and so forth. It hasn't been a brilliant success so far. And we think, I mean, if you look down, where, where these diseases actually get spread is a microprocess that actually happens in communities. So that's what we begin to do now. We look at the associations, the environmental factors. We're just, just beginning this now in Bali with a large study. Hope, at least we're, we have ambitions for a large study to see what are the ways, the interactive effects at the micro scale, right, at the micro scale. So we're just one little, everybody else in genetics does these big studies. We're just one little tiny, tiny group trying this out. But, uh, uh, we, you can, one can make a case, I think, that you're going to see the process at the, at the scale at which, it's, at which it occurs, that that's, uh, that's probably a pretty good way to go. Worth a try. <laughs> so I'll ask a simple question. Um, are there any um, narratives or myths that uh, these various villages have or part of their rituals that reflect any of this? I had another clip that I took out, which is uh, in, on the island of Sumba. They believe that their ancestors came from Munga, and in fact, their genetics points that way. And that seems extraordinary, because that would have been between two and 3,000 years ago. But in fact, it's consistent with what we see in terms of the spread, the diffusion of that population. There are, they, they mark their histories with megaliths, big stone slabs, veneers put out in front of their villages. So the, the ancient villages are still, you can still find them right on the hills of Sumba. So surprisingly, astonishingly, I mean, I don't believe it really, but I, I mean, I, it's hard to believe it. Imagine that, it, that they consistently point to Wunga as the origin. And if you ask me where do I think it started, I would also point to Wunga. So, so. Uh, Mark, Marcus Feldman, yes. of course, who does these kinds of studies in, in, in the large, so to speak, told me 
that uh, they have, um, and you probably know this much better than I, have enormous amounts of data on the, on, um, the DNA samples from uh, North American indigenous people. And they would very much like to do these kinds of studies, of course, for them. But they will not allow them, the indigenous people will not allow that data to be used. And the argument that they get back is, we didn't come across the Bering Straits, and we have no relationship whatsoever with the people in Alaska, even though we can understand much of their language. So it's it is this kind of question of treading on some kind of sensitivities. Yeah, you know, any kind of genetic research, I, you know, you'd agree it's a minefield. But uh, my argument is, my wife occasionally says, "Are you sure you want to keep going with this?" But I say, "Well." You know, should the benefits of molecular medicine be restricted to the rich? I mean, these, these are the, the ultimate goal of this project, the Ekman work, is, is not only to map the, the diversity, but also begin to you know, move towards molecular medicine for, for the endemic diseases of the region. We can take from, if, we take, if you've got malaria, we can get not only your DNA, but the DNA of the parasite in your blood, and correlate it, right, and try to see what phase it phase it is. So, so there's, a, I think, a tremendous potential for understanding disease at those local scales. And if that's true, then it's, uh, the argument is we should find ways to, be, to make it possible. That's what I think. Yeah, I mean, these these really really large scale genetic studies are just hugely expensive, and, mm -hmm. and now, um, you know, instead of just measuring five hundred thousand genetic markers, we can we can resequence uh, you know a whole genome, and, and, that, and that's now being proposed as the way that, that you know that all this stuff should go. But 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 I mean, the beautiful thing about doing uh, like as you describe the micro scale studies is is. You know, can you actually use these new genetic technologies to and, and related techniques um, in what traditionally would be called a clinically relevant sample size? I mean, are they actually poss possible to apply, you know, in 15 or 20 people with some benefit? And if that's possible to do, I think that's a, you know, would be a major, major step forward away from this idea that we've got to do everything in, in 100,000 people. Well, yeah, and actually, well, that, they're underpowered studies for certain types of phenomena. There's a question about where this will stop. We, we know that there are interaction, malaria and hepatitis, there are interaction action effects, it's complicated, and those are site specific. So I, if I wanted to you know, push my case, I'd say the, the butterfly point is, you know, if, if you just look at the global scale, you may be missing what's going, the very small changes in the local scale may be what's driving all kinds of things. Again, we didn't talk about the medical angle here, but, but uh, the, small change, at the global scale, that stuff gets averaged out, right? So perhaps the thing to do is to look at the scale at which changes actually occur. So what we look at is the genetics and the environment and the kinship system and the, even languages, because of course languages channel the flow of genes. I think I even said that in the film, right? Languages create corridors in which you're more likely to, people, to, to marry people whom you can talk with, right? Not completely, but there's that effect. And as time goes on, thus the, change, the rates at which language change occurs also can have an effect on the uh, in, in, intelligibility. Can influence social relationships over time. So those two those two are not independent processes. They are connected processes. Um, yeah. Uh, fascinating talk. Really enjoyed that. Uh, I'm just curious. I mean, you have uh, ethnic bones, uh, language, and uh, genetics in your equation. Now, if I want to put another uh, factor or variable into your equation, which is religion. I was wondering how it will affect, you know, the the marriage pattern. I assume that uh, the people that you're observing are predominantly Christian. No. No. So if the, I mean, uh, or I, I don't know, uh, you know, what religions the majority of these people you know worship. But I was wondering if if the religions that you know, they worship will affect, you know, the, the marriage pattern. If there's something changes with their belief that, uh, what, what is the impact of 
you know, certainly, absolutely. I mean, the, 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 we're mostly looking at tribal societies, so religion and myth is the basis of, is of the social structure, right? As Levi Strauss taught us many years ago. So it's, it's vital. And what's, it, what's, I think, impressive is that one finds similar patterns right across Indonesia, you know, several thousand miles, very distant societies that have been isolated, have not been in contact for thousands of years. You still find uh, dualism of mother and father, rocks and trees, all kinds of elements of belief that can be reconstructed from Proto-Austronesian language going back four to 5,000 years. They're remarkably durable, actually. What's amazing, I think, is how durable these patterns are. Um, yeah, are we, time for coffee? <laughs> Let's see. Yes, four o'clock. Yeah. Yeah, so, so let's conclude the session and thank Steve Lansing for the interesting talk and have coffee.